Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Ah, the much maligned wives' tale. Conspiracy theory. Even urban myth. Everyone feels that little charge of unearned pride when they can point at someone else and say, See? At least I'm not as bad as that guy. But we never want to consider the other questions involved. For instance, what if it's true? But you won't have to worry about that in tonight's little tale. A frightening fiction called A Tape from Treasure Island by the Zaxi. Hello all. Today, I went on an interesting trip. It took me a while to save up for the plane tickets, but it was worth it. Before I get into too much detail, I should probably introduce myself. Well, not really. I'm very paranoid when it comes to the internet, and I won't disclose my real name, so just call me Delmar. I don't know what it is about that name, but I've been taking a liking to it recently. Okay, let's get down to business. I recently got plane tickets to Florida, and I booked to stay at a small hotel near a special location. It was worth the six-hour plane ride for where I was going. If you haven't heard of it, I was planning on visiting an abandoned Disney resort called Discovery Island. I did my research, and it was originally known as Treasure Island in the early 70s. The mystery behind the island is very intriguing to me because it was shut down suddenly in 1999. There was a lot of controversy behind the island, and it's commonly accepted that this was the reason behind the island's abandonment. I don't necessarily accept that as easily as others might. I mean, don't get me wrong, I do believe it but solely because of the fact that there isn't enough information on the subject to prove or disprove it. This theory doesn't settle quite right with me. There isn't any public transportation to the island, so I had to call up a buddy to drop me off there. It's been about a day since my arrival in Florida, and I've got all of my gear ready. I brought a notebook for quick notes, a laptop for typing down documents, a vintage map of the island, which I discovered on the internet, a GPS, and a geocache. If I was going to an abandoned Disney park, I'm <laughs> gonna hide a geocache there. I was going to bring a standard camera, but I'd spent all of my money on the plane tickets and the hotel reservations, so no go. I hopped onto his boat, and we were off. The warm Florida air swerved past my temple and into the roots of my hair, relaxing me. This all went away as soon as the island entered my line of sight. I can't explain it. It was a strange mixture of happiness, excitement, and dread. I couldn't explain to you why I felt that, but I did. I also noticed that the air got thicker as we reached the island. I told myself, must be the humidity. But in hindsight, that wouldn't really make much sense. The change was too quick. It wasn't gradual enough to be natural. Ignoring it, my buddy pressed towards the island. Strange that he didn't seem to comment on the things that I'd noticed. We arrived at the island, and finally, after all of this research, I would finally be able to expose to the world what really happened at this mysterious island. Well, if I find anything to expose, that is. After stepping off the boat, I felt a sense of satisfaction. All of that hard work had led up to this moment. I waved goodbye to my friend, and he left me to my own devices. I immediately looked around for any landmarks. After finding one, I figured out where I was on the map and headed off for where I thought the most plausible places to find information were. The first place that I had in mind was, of course, the information booth. By the looks of the entrance, this was definitely a Disney park. It was very well crafted and very detailed. Most of the display looked sun damaged, bit cracked. Some of it, you could say, looked sandblasted. Well, I guess the years of wear and tear from the unforgiving Florida weather will take its toll on anything. 
I continued until I reached what looked like the information booth. The sign was faded and the paint was chipping. It was hanging by a nail and it obscured my view of the inside. I slid it out of the way and there was a perfectly normal information booth as expected. There was an eggshell white desk with assorted tickets laid out on it. It even had some pamphlets mixed in. Taking the liberty of grabbing one of the pamphlets, I ran over to the nearest bench and laid it out. As it was also faded and water damaged, I deciphered as much of its text as I could and typed it into a Word document. I noticed something funny though. I had an internet connection here. This place was closed in the 90s. Why would there be Wi-Fi here? Even if I could explain why there was, why did I connect without my knowledge? I didn't have auto connect on or anything. I, I checked the router name and the IP. The router name was Radio Nick. It didn't display an IP. It seemed to work fine. My internet browser was functioning perfectly. I shrugged it off and decided to take this opportunity to do a little more research. Didn't find anything that I didn't already know, so I continued to copy down the contents of the pamphlet. Finishing, I packed up my laptop and continued my journey. It was starting to get dark, which was strange. It was only two according to my laptop clock. I called up my buddy and he came and picked me up. Asked him what time it usually got dark in Florida. He told me around this time of year, which was June by the way, the sun set roughly 8 to 8.30. Perplexed, I opened up my laptop to see the time was in fact 8.30 p.m. It had literally said 2 o'clock 10 minutes ago. I didn't get it. Don't freak yourself out, I told myself. It was probably just that sketchy router you connected to that messed up your time. Probably was set to the wrong time zone or something. We arrived to shore and I took my rental car to the hotel. After typing this up, it's really put into perspective how weird that trip was. I'll pick up on my exploration tomorrow. I have about four more days on my reservation and I'm planning to make the best of all of them. That island is hiding something. Something big. I can't think of any logical explanation of what I've witnessed today. I feel dirty, impure. That's the only word that comes to mind when describing the way I feel. Something unholy has happened at that island and I feel it's my duty to find out what it is. Okay, uh, before I get into what happened, let me level with you for a second. Here's the information I've got. Remember in the last post when I told you to call me Delmar? You most likely thought that it was a completely random name, and in all honesty, at the time, I thought so too. Remember the name of that mystery Wi-Fi signal I was getting? It was uh, Radio Nick. Those two names are linked. I dug a little deeper into the story of the island and I found out the original owner of the island was a man by the name of Delmar Nicholson. His nickname was Radio Nick. I couldn't find any records on him, but I did get some information after interviewing some locals. They said he was the reclusive type. He seemed to have a dark cloud hovering over him all the time. He was antisocial, didn't talk to anybody. I've even heard some claims that he was, get this, satanic. Freaking satanic. That's a comforting thought while roaming an island previously owned by a freaking satanist. But I've heard other claims that he was legitimately Wiccan. Other people said that he was a combination of both, or as they described it, a Wiccan that believes in the power of Satan. Just keep that in mind when you're reading what happened to me. I had just arrived on the island. Uh, you could say I was a little uneasy, kind of on edge. I still got that same feeling of dread as the day before. Only this time, I felt more sad than anything. I still entered the park, determined to find out about this whole Radio Nick thing. 
I had planned my route the night before. My first stop was the Explorer's Outpost. Judging by its name, it was sort of the employee area. I couldn't find any info on it, but I was going to trust my gut. I headed up the dock and took a left. There was a building with a thatched roof that had splintered from storms during the closing and walls made out of various wooden sticks, most of them snapped in half. A small sign stood out front with Explorer's Outpost on it. I thought I was in the right place. Before proceeding inside, I looked up and I remembered the position of the sun. I walked through what was left of the deteriorating front door and into a tropical room. It had an information desk and some benches. Uh, all of the ropes used to form lines had fallen over and the door leading to behind the desk was blown apart, more so than most of the room. It was as if something had forced its way into the back. I proceeded with caution into the back room. There was a room with a bunch of filing cabinets inside. Most of them hung open and half the files were on the floor. The corner in particular was very dark, almost unnaturally so. But something about it made me freeze. Something turned its head around and its eyes reflected the light coming into the room. Then the eyes seemed to lunge at me. The light, of course, revealed it to be a vulture. It stopped short of my face, and instead of attacking me, it hovered a while, waving its wings at me as if shooing me away. I fell on my back, and the vulture landed on the ground below it. Then it bowed its head at me. My heart was racing a mile a minute, but that gesture made me somehow feel safe. Then it looked up at me, and pointed its beak toward a cabinet. It tapped its beak on the cabinet's face. The label read real estate. I opened up the cabinet as the vulture watched. Only about five folders were present, uh, so I took them and the vulture waved its wings. Okay, you've got my attention. It taps its beak on another cabinet. This was the employee records, so I took those as well. To my surprise, I turned around for more instructions and the bird was gone. I didn't hear it fly away or anything, it was just gone. I wouldn't say I fled the island, though I did walk briskly at a pace that you could compare to running in fear. <clears throat> I sat at the dock and waited for my buddy to come pick me up. When he arrived, I was so relieved. But as soon as I stepped onto his boat, this overwhelming feeling of fear and dread overcame me and I felt really dizzy. I fell over into my buddy's arms and he drove me home. He's a good friend. I took it easy from there and I still feel really uneasy and sad about, well, I don't know. I feel constricted for some reason, as if there is something looming over me, something that I can't control. Now, despite my mental condition, I'm still looking into what happened on the island. I should probably start looking through those papers. See you all soon! Guys, this is going to be a very short post, but this is the information I got. It perfectly correlates with what happened yesterday. I was looking through those employee records and my suspicions have been confirmed. That Radio Nick guy was a huge Satanist. The employee summary says that after the island was sold to Disney Corporation, Radio Nick, we'll call him Nicholson, uh, applied as an employee after the island construction was completed. They assumed it was because he couldn't bear to leave his beloved island or something like that. In the first couple of years, he acted normally. But in his later years there, just before the closing, other employees noticed a change in his behavior. Every day, like clockwork, he walked into the jungle by the South American aviary section not to be seen for a couple of hours.
His superiors continually told him that this behavior affected his workflow. This eventually led to his termination. Interestingly enough, the employee summary just abruptly ends there, but handwritten after the end of the summary was some Russian text. It took me about half an hour to decipher the individual symbols, and I finally translated it online to the words Lucifer's Fowl Game, F-O-W-L, like birds. This astonished me and left me a bit confused. I analyzed what it could mean, and I've come to the conclusion that this whole thing has to do with birds. The vulture was the key. I've read up that in some cultures the vulture is considered to be a symbol of good. It makes me think that these vultures are trying to protect me from something as well as to expose the truth. I also have read that there was a controversy connected to the vultures that took place when the park was still active. Disney employees were killing vultures because they said they were endangering the avian life on the island. I think the vultures were trying to get rid of the birds because they were connected with something evil. Or someone. Someone going by the name Radio Nick. That's all I've got so far in terms of theories, so if any of you have any critique on my theory or any information that could help, please don't hesitate to contact me. I should also note that I've used all of my food money to buy a digital camera. Nothing fancy, actually quite cheap. I'll be sending pictures now if I can. I'll be leaving for the island soon. Please, wish me luck. Hey guys, this is Delmar's friend. I'm the one who's been boating him back and forth from the island. I have some weird news for you guys. Delmar is currently incapacitated and incapable of getting a post out. He's out cold on his hotel bed right now and he's been having night terrors. I'm worried about what he's been doing out on that island. All I really know is that he's been getting tenser every time I take him there, and that most recent ride I gave him, he tried to pass off one of those dollar store disposable digital cameras as something to use on a vacation. Uh, I let him borrow my camera, and he graciously accepted. After leaving, I was only in my house for 15 minutes before receiving a text from him. The text said, Come now and I raced to my car when I arrived on the island I found him face down out like a light on the ground after failing to wake him up I just carried him to the boat and then brought him back to the hospital the doctor said he was okay uh, at first they thought that he was knocked out with a concussion but then they examined him and found nothing wrong they just prescribed some rest so I did just that. I know that this blog is important to him, so I thought it'd probably be right if I posted something while he's unavailable. Just wanted to update you, you know, all you guys who follow his blog. Uh, he should be awake by tomorrow. That's it. I am done. I'm never setting foot on that island again. I just got home from Florida. I waited a while before typing this post for the sake of my sanity. Just let me explain what happened. I just woke up and I don't remember anything. My buddy was there and he explained what he saw happen. Um, we talked for a while before he left because he had errands to run, job to do. I got comfy in my bed and turned on the TV. The TV illuminated the room and I noticed the camera that my buddy let me borrow. I guess he forgot it. I got out of bed, picked it up, turned it on to see if I should charge the battery. You know, common courtesy. It was then that I noticed that there was only a couple of minutes left on the tape. He gave me a blank tape with about two hours of footage on it. That means that I recorded something. That's impossible, though, since I'd only been on the island for about half an hour. 
this morbid curiosity overcame me and I decided to plug it in and watch it. Jeez. It started out with me waving goodbye to him. I began my hike through the island. The video cut to me at the aviary section of the island. Now keep in mind, I don't remember any of this. I was looking around for anything that might answer some questions, so I headed for the maintenance area behind the bird exhibits. I closed the door behind me, being the genius I am, <laughs> it was somewhat dark in there. Uh, light enough so that you could see, but dark enough to make you feel uncomfortable. It was a room full of bags of bird seed, and some were ripped open, spilled on the floor. There was a bucket in the corner, from what I can see, with some scrapers next to it. I could only guess what that was for. I continued on into the dim room, where I found a room with a bunch of pedestals scattered on the floor. It seemed like they were ripped off by something and hastily thrown into another room. I put the camera on a nearby AC unit and I watched myself pick one of them up. I looked surprised, a bit scared. I showed the camera the face of the pedestal. It was one of those information pedestals that taught you about the bird that it was showcasing. It had an upside down pentagram burned into it. I paused the tape to clear my head, after which I continued, bracing for the worst. I picked up another one and showed this one to the camera upside down cross with what appeared to be a crude Mickey Mouse nailed to it. I put it down slowly, but a bang made me freeze. I stood there for about 10 seconds before something made me grab the camera and run. The video cut to me walking around the outside. It was dark out now. Using a flashlight to lead the way, I briskly walked through the park. It was eerily quiet. The only sounds that I could hear were breathing, heavy breathing, and quiet footsteps. This continued for about 10 minutes. The video cuts again. This time, I was in what appeared to be a bathroom. I was kneeling on the ground facing the side of the stall. I was leaning on it as if I was being deprived of strength. I turned around towards the camera and started to softly sob. I was feeling uneasy watching this as I don't normally cry. After a bit of sobbing, a female sounding voice in the distance simply stated, stop, in a firm voice. I did as she commanded. I hesitated for a bit, and without warning, I punched a hole through the hard plastic stall wall and began to scream before the video cut to a new scene. This time I was in a security room. All of the TVs were functioning perfectly. They were all displaying different parts of the island. People were hustling and bustling about the exhibits and displays. The camera zoomed in on a date displayed in the corner. All I could get out of this was Thursday and then 1999. I believed that to be the date of the park closing. It showed that there was one man that climbed over the railing into the jungle. The security feed began to fast forward and stopped after 10 seconds. What I saw next, I couldn't get out of my mind. All of the people in all of the feeds were covering their ears and bending over in agony. The only people that weren't were the employees who started to show alarm. Now, I could understand why. If everybody except me and my coworkers was beginning to act like that, I'd panic too. They tried things from shaking the people to hitting them. None of them got anyone to respond. One of the employees stood up, shouted something at the other employees, and started to run away with them as if away from something in particular, something frightening. I soon realized that that was when a black mist started rolling over the island visitors at a surprising rate. It didn't even seem like mist, just a, a mass that consumed the camera's view. I stopped the security feed and backed away to show all of the TVs. Then 
just a soft voice spoke to me from behind. Hello? The camera swerves around to see Snow White staring blankly into the camera. Have you met Nick yet? She undergoes this gruesome transformation. Her eye sockets turned a dark black and her veins around her eyes splintered out from the center. Her eyes turned white and she violently cocked her head to the side with a loud crunch. Her jaw dropped and almost touched her shoulder as she let out what sounded like a piercing scream. It was so loud that it distorted the audio. She put her arms straight out in front of her and lunged for the camera before it cut again. Next, I was wandering through what appeared to be a plaza sort of place. I, every once in a while, peered into one of the displays or snack bars, and every time, I would find another pentagram burnt into the ground on the inside. My silence at this point in the tape worried me. Um, whispering became audible, but it was multiple voices. My footsteps became paired with another, and another, and so on. My walk became a brisk jog, and I stopped checking in the displays. I was tempted to stop the video here, but I gathered my courage and pressed on. I abruptly stopped in place while the whispering in the footsteps grew louder. I quickly turned around to find nothing, while the whispering in the footsteps stopped. I let out a pained sigh of relief, or at least that's what it sounded like. Then I turned back around to again to be greeted by Mickey Mouse, and he said, Have you met Nick yet? Now, Mickey began to violently shake, after which his eyes exploded, sending entrails and blood spewing out of his eye sockets. I heard a scream from an unknown voice, and then halfway through the explosion, the video cuts again. After yet another cut, it was lighter out. Blood was splattered on the camera, but just a little. I was sobbing again, but I was holding the camera and walking through the woods. The camera jerked forward and I almost dropped it. It pointed down at the ground where an arm was sticking out of the ground, grabbing my ankle. I pulled away and pulled the rest of the body that belonged to the arm out with it. It was a sickly version of Mowgli, the protagonist from the Jungle Book. He looked gray and he strangely had more contrast than the rest of the shot. His hair had fallen out, leaving only a couple of dangling strands, and I started screaming for help, I guess. I dropped the camera, showing a shot of multiple Mowgli's climbing on the trees. They were all barking and yelling. My foot had just escaped the camera's view as all of the Mowgli's pounced on me at once, also escaping the camera's view. After that, it got quiet. The camera sat there for roughly 30 seconds. Then, re-entering the view, I stood up picked up the camera. I walked through the jungle for a while until I got to a cliff. I had to jump over a railing to get to it. I placed the camera down and walked toward the edge of the cliff, leaned over, and fell. I'm done. Look, I'm done asking questions, done being curious. I am done looking for answers. Done. I refused to try to analyze anything I saw on that tape. I refused to further explore the topic. I am done with this blog. This will be my last post. Now, I, I know this may be an anticlimactic ending for you, and I'm sorry, but I honestly couldn't care. Feel free to speculate and discuss any theories on this. Just know that I will not be answering any questions. No, I will not provide the video. I'm not wasting my time digitizing it. The only thing I will provide is this picture I found on my digital camera that I bought. Goodbye all. 
I am done. Done. So yes, it is still comforting to be able to say, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. But in this case, I don't think it's quite as, um, satisfying. Stay scary, wildlings. If the damn vultures are trying to talk to you, consider noping out and make the most of your nights.